Hello and welcome to this Bird and Bond and Agritecture webinar on urban agriculture. My name is Henry Gordon Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Agritecture Consulting, and I'm excited today to speak to you about an introduction to urban agriculture as part of our collaboration with Bird and Bond, the uh, Belgian Association for Farmers. So on our call today, we have my colleague Bea and Yara, and then we're also joined by Nele. So we're really excited to get started and we're gonna dive right in. I'm gonna give you some instructions for Zoom, so, so, so just stay tuned for those. So first of all, let's talk about our Zoom rules. This is the software we're using. If you have any questions at all during this time, you can enter them in the chat box. My colleague Bea will let me know what they are and we'll take those questions at the end and give our best attempt to answer them for you and direct to you where you can learn more about it. So just use the chat button and enter the message and we'll get those questions from you. You're all muted, so uh, that's the only way to communicate with us and we hope you're enjoying yourselves at home and we hope you're all safe and sound. And make sure you send your message to everyone so everyone gets it. So the obvious news is that COVID-19 has spread across the globe and affected all of us. And one of the things that it's really revealed is our fragile food supply chain. And so I think this discussion around urban agriculture and the localization of food to our cities is especially relevant. And here are some news articles about what's happening in the context of food. If you want to read more about this, I definitely invite you to check out Agritecture. For example, we posted a recent blog post with five different urban farms in New York City and how they're adapting to COVID-19. So it's really interesting to see how these unique types of farms are also facing certain challenges, where they can overcome the challenges of COVID-19, but also how they're having to adapt themselves. And you may learn some things from that. So that's a recent post. You can just go to agritecture.com and click knowledge and go down to blog. So first of all, let's talk about urban agriculture. I think when we talk about urban agriculture in general terms, we mostly think about growing food that's maybe in a community garden and for local residents to enjoy. Maybe it's something that looks good, but it's not that productive. But I invite all of you to think a bit bigger about the potential for urban agriculture. For example, I want you to ask the question, when we think about the nexus, the relationship between food, water, waste, and energy, when we think about our future and how we need to solve this nexus in the context of the city, try to think of a new technology, a sustainable technology that's developing that embodies this nexus better than urban agriculture. When we engage in food production in the city, we practice the production of food, we practice how to be efficient with water, we practice biomass, waste, and we have to think about all the energy needed to do that, especially in the controlled environment systems, which is one type of urban agriculture we're gonna talk about. So I think when we think about urban agriculture, don't just think about the yield, think about the impacts across the categories of the city, and think about the bigger picture of how this could accelerate some of our understanding of sustainable urban development. Already today, cities are leading the demand for urban agriculture. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation released a really amazing report recently, which covered the fact that 80% of our total food demand, that value of that food demand comes from our cities. So wait a minute, if cities are consuming all of our food, why aren't they involved in the production of our food? Isn't it important that the people consuming food also understand where our food comes from what food is available and how it's produced, how it's transported. This is really important. And I think for me growing up, I had the benefit of growing up in a society where I could just go to the supermarket and buy whatever I wanted, no matter what the season was. I knew nothing about urban agriculture. I was raised in Hong Kong and Tokyo, cities that are not focused on agriculture whatsoever. So it's really exciting to speak to all of you who are many of you are farmers and learn more and, and, and share some ideas about the relationship that cities can have in the food system overall, and how maybe recently it's shifted, where cities are really the, the definers of the food system more than ever before. Let's talk a little bit deeper about urban agriculture and kind of what's driving it and some of the trends that are making it happen. So I think the first one, which is you know, why it's becoming more important is because of demand. Consumers are getting really excited about local demand. They're getting excited about a local product which takes less time to get to them. They see it as fresher and they see it as more sustainable. And there's sufficient data in the US and you can even look in the EU of the demand for that local food. Another one is that as cities have, has, have developed, we've seen that there's divides between certain races and certain wealth categories. And so what these do is they reflect and they demonstrate and kind of expose is the right word. They expose the inequalities in our cities. And food represents one of those inequalities very effectively. 
People can buy certain food because of the way they were raised and the background they came from and the wealth category they come from, the class they come from, while others are exposed to it or, or removed from it rather. If we look in New York City, for example, the Bronx, which is in one of the wealthiest cities in the world, New York, has been left behind and has low access to food. In the United States, they call these food deserts, places where it takes you a long time to walk or to access fresh food. And thankfully in Europe, especially in Belgium, you don't have as much of this issue. But I think if we look deeper in some of the neighborhoods in Brussels, we would notice that there's also some divide and inequality uh, from these various categories and food can represent that. Another thing that's making it kind of have a renaissance right now is climate change. As climate change puts pressure on our food systems and the resources needed to grow it, we're trying to develop new ways to grow it more efficiently, not only outside of the city, but also in the city. I, as I said, I grew up in Hong Kong and Tokyo, and the reason why I was attracted to urban agriculture was because to me it reflected this opportunity to bring greenery back into the city, to think about the city not just as a consumer of energy and a producer of waste, but to think about the city as something that's green and productive and part of the natural world. Urban agriculture has a really interesting ability to do this because it's not just an aesthetic impact, it's about producing and feeding. And so it becomes a reflection of nature in the city that can also, also create economic wealth. So this becomes kind of a player in the city where something that's just for aesthetic may not. Another important issue that's happening in the US and the EU is that farmers are getting older. As I said, um, I grew up very disconnected from farming. I had no idea. And certainly my parents didn't raise me and said, you know what, Henry, you should become a farmer. That's the best thing you could do. Most people are raising their children to become lawyers or technologists. And so what that's doing is it's making kind of agriculture less sexy. If we bring agriculture back into the city, we can make it attractive again and respond to this aging population. Another major driver about why this is happening globally is because of technology. With the advancements of AI, the internet of things, IOT, big data, how you can study data and bring it in and make decisions and automation technologies, suddenly we can do a lot more with less. We can understand what we're learning from the first stages we do things. So these are some of the reasons why this is a hot topic. Now my colleague Yara is going to go through the history of urban agriculture briefly. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I also want to just give a quick introduction to myself. I'm the operations director at Agritecture. A lot of the work that I do revolves around the economic analysis portion of our feasibility studies. I also do help. Um, with kind of just the overall financial management of the company. And I did also operate and manage a greenhouse in the Bronx, actually, um, for about two years previously as well. So yeah, I'm going to jump into the history of urban agriculture. Again, this is something that's super brief. And the point of putting it into this intro presentation is to just show that urban agriculture is nothing new. These are just three different case studies that you know, provide a brief history lesson to urban ag. And typically you'll find that the commonality between all three of them is that urban ag was done out of a need for self-sufficiency or because of some sort of war or lack of import of food in a time. So the first um, case study that you see, we have medieval city gardens. So this is said to have originated from the monasteries and their need to be self-sufficient for nutrition and economic survival. So you found that people by the end of the 12th century cultivated ornamental gardens around the castle walls. And that's kind of seen as the first form of vertical farming. So in, around the 15th century, you found crops like fruits, berries, plants, different kinds of medicinal and ornamental plants being grown um, in that area. In the next case study, the next slide, we have victory gardens. So this is a US-based example. So we found that during World War I and II, a lot of farmers had to join the service. And so as a result of that, food supplies were being rationed and reduced. So as a direct result, you saw a lot of Americans starting to plant gardens in their own backyards, in empty lots, in rooftop spaces. And so by, um, during World War I, you found we found that around 3 million garden plots were actually planted and by World War II, that jumped up to 20 million. And the really interesting part of all of this was that that actually produced about 40% of the nation's fresh vegetables at that time. 
And the last example that we have in the next slide are Havana Gardens. So this was in the 90s. It was a result of food imports ending um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. You found that highly educated urban citizens, they started to organize themselves and similar to the previous example, um, decided to grow food in their own urban areas. So by 1995, Havana had 25,000 allotments tended by families and urban cooperatives. And by 2008, you found that these food gardens as a result made up 8% of the land in Havana and 3.4% in urban land in Cuba, producing 90% of all fruits and vegetables. Um, so hopefully those were just some interesting facts for you all. We're going to jump into the many ways that cities can grow food. So Henry, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Yara. I think it's really important to look back at the past because if we look at all those examples, there was some global crisis that really initiated it. I mean, maybe not the medieval mm -hmm. one, but in the med medieval eras, they had to kind of have some security and protection. But if you look at the last two, it was a reaction. And so if we think about COVID-19, how might that affect urban agriculture? ask yourself that question as well. And thank you for that submission of that question for the Antwerp question and, and the historical case study there. We know this is something that has existed for Europe for a long time. So I'm gonna go through kind of the multiple ways you can grow food in the city um, and try to cover the most important ones. So the first one is on ground soil. So we, at Agriculture, we try to think about these as typologies, right? We try to categorize the integration is what we call it. How do you intervene in the urban environment with some kind of agriculture and what are the pros and cons of each of those? So all of these slides are, are in that same format. So soil production is amazing because what it allows you to do is it allows you to create a, a wider diversity of crops. Because you have that soil, you can really grow root, rooting crops, you can grow vegetables, you can grow orchards, you can grow all kinds of things, beans, and, and you don't have those options with every other kind of, of agriculture form that we're gonna go through. Um, it also has other environmental benefits that are great. It can actually cool down the city, it can manage rainwater, it can actually help remediate soil depending on the kind of crops you have. Usually those aren't edible, but that's also a type of urban agriculture. But some of the cons are that, you know, if a cold weather comes to Brussels, it's gonna be difficult to grow certain crops. It doesn't eliminate all your options, but that frost is gonna make it difficult to grow year round um, in soil. So that's gonna be difficult. Also, you can have shadows from other buildings in the city that might affect that crop because you don't have any additional lighting. Um, and you also have issues, for example, in New York City, there's really no good soil to be able to produce in the ground. All the soil for urban agriculture has to be brought from somewhere else. And so that does have some sustainability questions as well. So when we're looking at the city and we're thinking about on-ground soil, we have to ask ourselves these questions. What are the pros and cons? Protected soil. This is really protected agriculture in general. This is where we take the soil production and we create a protective layer over it. Sometimes it's a DIY, do-it-yourself system. Sometimes it's kind of kits, greenhouse kits that you use to cover it. Um, but essentially it's a way of kind of protecting the plants from some of the temperature. You can create a microclimate within a bed space of soil-based urban agriculture and create its own little climate and extend that season a little bit. And so again, you still get the crop variety and you can extend that season. Those are some of the pros. But some of the cons are is that as those get larger, you may need to actually file for some permitting that might make it difficult to find a site. You have winds that maybe move them over because they're usually made of wood or light metal. Um, and you have the other typical challenges that may happen with soil-based agriculture. Just so you know, at the bottom of each of these slides, we have some examples. Either it's an example to kind of give more light to what I talked about, or it's specific farms you can look at that utilize this method. And you're gonna get all of these slides and this, this webinar recorded. So don't worry about it. You're gonna get all of this afterwards. So underground vertical farming. What an interesting concept. You know, when we think about cities, there's a lot of available underground space in parking lots or basements. And so when we go underground, we have to start utilizing controlled environment agriculture, which is a category of growing food indoors you're probably familiar with. But essentially, it's where we start to control the environment further with light and climate control, et cetera. And so when we go into a basement, we really have no sunlight. So it's not a greenhouse. It has to become a vertical farm. You have to stack layers of cultivation. It could be using soil or it could be hydroponic using soilless methods. And so the pros of this are that it's protected completely from pesticides and pests. It's, it's a protected environment that's closed and could arguably become a cleaner product in the, view of, in, in the eyes of some customers. These hydroponic systems are recirculating, so there's other typical benefits from that um, that cover across hydroponics. 
some of the cons of these indoor environments, especially in basements, are that there's not a lot of big basements. So you're gonna have a lot of equipment in a small space, and that typically increases your capital cost. And we'll see a similar thing when we talk about shipping container farms. Also, all of these lights and all of this technology requires energy, and that increases the carbon footprint of these farms per square foot and per gram of output of production. So it's not necessarily automatically green. You have to weigh the trade-offs of saving that water, saving that space, and considering that carbon footprint. Building vertical farming is kind of what we're calling the, the, the most biggest trend in vertical farming, which is kind of the construction of new or conversion of warehouses into vertical farms. So just as I talked about before, these are stacked systems, typically hydroponic, with no soil and no sunlight to achieve ultimate control. One of the pros of this I just want to highlight some more is food safety. When you're completely indoors, you can control those food safety requirements a lot more strictly. And if we look at some of the examples here, like Aero Farms, it provides really a high level of food safety. They've made that commitment, and that's how they want to compete on the market when consumers are thinking about what they should choose. If you look at Vertical Harvest, it's more about a cold environment in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And what Vertical Farming provides there is it allows them to engage with the youth and the disabled individuals that are participants in this program year round, no matter what the weather is. So that keeps them active. So it's another main benefit of this vertical farming integration. But again, we have a high CapEx, we have a high carbon footprint in some cases. And I think one of the most important cons of vertical farming is very limited crop selection. We're talking about microgreens, herbs, and leafy greens, and some tomatoes in some cases. Eventually strawberries will be commercialized too. But right now it's a pretty limited set of production, unlike soil. Rooftops are great because rooftops are also available spaces in the city that are often underutilized. Again, when you build a, a rooftop greenhouse, or sorry, this, in this case, a soil, a greenhouse, you would then be able to create insulation for the building. So where Yara worked at um, Sky Vegetables, that building was able to get tax grants for ensuring that it created insulation. It also recycled the water in the building and created jobs. So it creates kind of a new opportunity for converting unused spaces into productive ones in the city. And if it's a greenhouse, it's year round, which is great. Some of the cons are that rooftop greenhouses are much, much more expensive than on the ground greenhouses. Uh, typically they could be 50%, 100%, 150% more expensive. So a significant increase above what you do on the ground. And that's related to obviously a lot of the engineering, but also the construction and how strong it needs to be. It typically has to be glass because if a strong wind comes, it gets blown away. So again, it's just not that easy and you really need a big scale to justify that capex. So unless you're doing it in soil or exposed, it's gonna be pretty challenging to do rooftop greenhouses. And if we look at Gotham Greens, which is probably the leader in rooftop greenhouses, you can see their latest news as they're moving to the ground. And I think that's an interesting signal of how these rooftop greenhouses are responding to what they learn as they grow as a business. A greenhouse can be on the ground as well. Um, Gotham Greens has some on the ground facilities as mentioned, and you get all the benefits of year round production and it's a relatively proven business. So in the city, it's gonna be a question of, can, will your customer pay more? And also a question of, can you get enough space to achieve scale? And there are some opportunities in certain cities, but maybe really big cities is gonna be difficult. Micro farms are kind of these small vertical farms that live inside restaurants or in your home. Typically right now, they're getting very popular in restaurants and also kind of food halls. And so this is low cost in the sense that you don't have to spend a huge capex overall, but it is definitely gonna be more expensive per square foot because you have to make it very attractive and beautiful and engaging. So Babylon Micro Farms and Smallhold are good examples of this. And one of the key things to remember about this method is you typically have a centralized location where you grow the young plants and then you distribute them to the customer where the plants will grow out and finish and be harvested. Now what you get out of that is the customer is gonna pay the top price because they're having the best experience, but you still get the efficiency of an at scale farm. We typically call this distributed agriculture. That's what this system is called. And micro farms are one part of that. While the centralized location could be called the hub or the main production center. I definitely invite you to check out the examples because you can really see how real businesses are raising money around these ideas, what they're growing, how they're doing it and how they make themselves look. You've probably heard about shipping container farms. These are also a very hot trend, even from the early days of vertical farming. I think the reason is that they're standardized. They're typically uh, 40 feet or, yeah, anyway, I, I can't convert to meters right now, but they're typically standardized containers around the globe. 
and you build them, convert them into vertical farms, you can sell them as single units. Some of the cons are that they really aren't at scale. You know, we estimate that one laborer, one farm manager could really handle three to four containers. But when you buy one, you're looking at spending 80,000 to 100,000 euros. So that's a lot of money to spend. And, and you have to buy four of those really, or three or four of those to get the maximum out of your employee. So that's why a lot of people move towards the warehouses because you can get that scale and some efficiency without the container. But the container is very attractive for research, for education, and for anyone that does have that CapEx and wants to start with something smaller. Uh, some of the assumptions about containers are that it's kind of plug and play. You get it, you plug it in, it works. It's actually much more complicated than that. You have to sometimes go through permitting to allow the container to be there. You have to create water and energy connections. So definitely don't, don't underestimate the challenges of setting up your container farm. So now we're going to go into some urban agriculture categories, impact right. categories. Thank you, Yara. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to walk through four different what we call urban ag impact categories that you can use to sort of contextualize the different kind of urban farms that maybe inspire you, interest you, or ones that you potentially want to start. So the first one is aesthetic. You want to think about the fact, you know, does the farm really inspire you to live and behave more sustainably? So you want to imagine first, let's say it's location. So Brussels is a pretty relatively highly dense, um, densely populated area, you know, compared to the country. So think about how that farm looks in regards to the surrounding, in regards to the community. You know, is it is the greenery something that is inspiring? You know, can it be reconstructed in a different sort of way? How does it fit within the city or the rural area? The next impact category we have is economic in the next slide so you know when it comes to this category you want to ask yourself you know does the farm generate living wage jobs and long-term economic value so you know this varies from farm to farm but essentially when you're talking about a lot of controlled environment agriculture, the operational costs could be a little bit higher. And so you want to think about the trade-offs in that regard and to how many people can you hire? What can I do to make sure that my urban farm is sustainable long-term, is providing value to my community, and is also providing food to my local consumers? And then the next one, that we have is social. So we're going to get into the social impact category a little bit more in this presentation, just because we think, we think it's suitable for this introduction. And the following one, which is environmental, that we'll kind of get into more details about. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see a list of different social challenges that we find in our food system today. I'm going to kind of go through them one by one. And then on you know, on the top row, you're going to see three different type of urban farming typologies. And we're going to try to understand, you know, when it comes to these challenges, does this typology work as a sort of solution for that challenge? And if it does, you'll see a little tick or kind of a point given to that um, typology. So let's go through these issues really quick. So we have, you know, your labor force health ergonomics. So this is, you know, we were talking in the economic slide a little bit about a living wage, but this also relates to the environment that your labor is in as well, right? You're thinking about heating conditions. You're thinking about hours worked. Um, the next challenge that you're seeing, lack of year-round jobs. You know, how, how long is this person going to be employed, right? When you're looking at controlled environment agriculture, you are allowed to kind of grow year round because you're controlling everything and all the, everything within that growing area. But when you're looking at some more outdoor farms, you know, jobs go alongside the seasonality of when you can grow. And typically that's about two seasons out of the year. Um, another challenge, food access and food sovereignty, these kind of go hand in hand as well. You know, food accessibility really relates to can you provide food at an affordable price locally to the community at hand? Food sovereignty is also similar to that idea, kind of the right of people to have healthy, accessible food. Then we have lack of education around food ecology. So this is just making sure that urban farming models also go hand in hand with an educational model. You don't always see that as the case with farms. So we'll go into that a little bit more. 
And then finally, the geopolitical pressure on imported food supplies. So this is incredibly relevant and important for countries that import a majority of their food. This is something that's definitely um, a challenge to consider. So if we're going to go through urban CEA farms as an example, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but you know we would put a check mark for labor force and health and ergonomics. So when you're in a CEA farm, you're kind of creating more ideal working conditions. You find with some outdoor farms that some worker conditions might not be as ideal. So for example, some of these farm workers may have to be spraying pesticides outdoors. They might have to work in the heat all day, depending on the location they're in, you know, kind of bend down to harvest the food. Whereas if you're looking at a farm like a, like a greenhouse, an indoor greenhouse with the elevated channels, that might, not, that might not need to happen as much when harvesting. You typically have a cooled environment, so it's a little bit easier on the labor force. Again, I, I talked about this a little bit, but lack of year-round jobs. So again, this relates to extending the seasonality of when we can grow food. Again, you know, when you have cold climates and you're able to work in a greenhouse that you can heat in a sustainable way, and you're able to kind of grow that food, you can obviously keep your labor force beyond just the spring and the summer, for example. Now, food accessibility and food sovereignty, urban CEA farms, don't necessarily get a check mark here. And the main reason for that is that, you know, when it comes to food accessibility, you also want to think about affordability of the food. And unfortunately, at this moment for CEA farms, operational costs are still a little bit high. While that is improving with the efficiency of technology, that's still something that is a challenge today. And so because of that higher cost, you know, typically the produce that you'll find in some of these farms is also a higher price. Um, when it comes to education, you do actually find that there are a lot of urban uh, CEA examples like App Harvest, Teens for Food Justice is a local organization here, here in New York, you have Square Roots, which, which is a pretty popular farm. They all kind of have this baseline in education and training, so they get a check mark there. And then with the geopolitical pressure challenge, you know, when you are growing, um, the one of the benefits of growing in urban CEA farm is that you're able to theoretically place that farm anywhere. And so a lot of times that's a big advantage um, in regards to increasing, you know, the amount of local food that's available. So in the next slide, we're going to focus on urban outdoor soil farms. So for, for the urban outdoor soil farms, I did mention this a little bit, but with, in regards to the labor force and the lack of year-round jobs, again, this isn't the case everywhere, but typically you do see that the conditions may be a little bit more difficult, whether that's in regards to the health and ergonomics section or in regards to the lack of year-round jobs that would be available. However, when it comes to things like food access and food sovereignty, you find that these farms really play an incredibly important role because the baseline of their objectives is around producing local food that's accessible, whether that's because it's subsidized by the government or that's just their operational model, they're able to produce food and distribute it for free or for a very subsidized price. Education is also a really big component of these farms as well. You'll find that a lot of the labor force are volunteers, for example. So training is a really important aspect of these farms. And, you know, in regards to the geopolitical pressure, um, you know, on, on imported food supplies, yes, you're not producing as much, depending on the scale of these farms, you might not produce as much as a CEA farm. However, it is still a local food source. And so it is part of that bigger solution of you know, localizing food supplies. And finally, we have rural regenerative, regenerative farms. Um, and so if you're looking across the board here, you know, when it comes to um, the labor force and year-round jobs, it kind of relates a little bit to the urban outdoor soil farm. Food accessibility and food sovereignty, this is interesting because it does depend here. However, you know, just for this exercise, I think it's important to, to note that while these farms have a huge environmental impact, which we'll get into in the next couple slides, you will find that similar to CEA farms, the operational expenses could be a bit higher. 
And you find that typically when you're dealing with farms that are a little bit more organic or that really take care of the resources that are used and inputs that are used within the farm. Unfortunately, these things are sometimes a higher price. And so you aren't able to, let's say, distribute the food for free always. Um, however, when it comes to education, and again, you know, the geopolitical pressure on imported food supplies, they do get a check mark here because it is also a baseline as to, you know, increasing the local food supply and also making sure that there is a really strong training and educational element. And in the next slide, what you see here is that, you know, I guess the point that we want to bring up here is actually that there's no solution for solving all of these challenges we have, let's say the challenge of feeding the world or providing accessibility to agriculture. So instead you need to think about all of these things being the solutions, right? Um, the solution is really a combination of everything. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but I do want to move into the environmental, perfect, the environmental aspect of this presentation. So. Um, the question that you want to answer here, does the farm improve biodiversity, water management, and reduce pollution? So if you go to the next slide, we'll see similar to um, the first table, a list of different challenges that we're finding today. So um, the first row that you see, the 25% or more greenhouse gas emissions, that's a reduction of 25% of greenhouse gas emissions or more. For the next um, item, you have 70% fresh water usage. So that's reducing your fresh water usage by 70% or more. Fresh water contamination is pretty straightforward. Biodiversity and pollinator loss um, is also, I think, pretty straightforward. You have your arable land per person ratio. So making sure that you have um, enough arable land or enough farmable land um, for the population at hand. You have the urban heat island effect, which in brief is essentially, you know, um, the fact that you typically find in city areas that it's a lot warmer there than in uh, surrounding rural areas due to usually, um, you know, human made activities. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when it comes to sequestering carbon and emitting carbon dioxide. And then we have the last one, which is the combined sewage overflow. Um, so you'll find that this is a big issue in a lot of urban areas. I know that New York and Paris, this is also a really big thing. Um, and typically with older cities, they have this issue. But the idea is that when it rains a lot, and in New York specifically, I think it's about an inch of water, when it rains that much, you find that the sewage water and the rainwater combines, and then it is um, it flows through the sewage system in our waterways, and um, pollutes the natural water resources that we have in the city. And so that's kind of also one of the challenges that we're going to discuss through this activity. So to jump right in, we have urban CEA farms. Again, they, there isn't a check mark here for greenhouse gas emissions just because um, you know, these are indoor controlled environments. And a lot of times you are still using heating and cooling that uses a lot of energy here. So it isn't necessarily done the most efficient way. I think there are a lot of farming examples that show otherwise and that reuse heat in a really interesting way, but it just isn't common right now. Um, for freshwater usage, you know, urban CEA farms and hydroponics specifically is known to reduce a lot of water due to the recirculating system involved. Um, same with freshwater contamination. Um, that kind of relates to that because you are reducing the amount of water you're using and a lot of times it is filtered um, if need be. In regards to biodiversity and pollinator loss, there isn't really any sort of um, benefit there just because a lot of times these farms are indoors. So there isn't really much impact on the environment. Um, the arable land per person ratio it would apply here just because you are increasing the amount of farmland that's present, whether that's in a city or a peri-urban area. And again, for the urban heat island effect, um, it isn't something that has much of an impact. Again, similar because of the, the greenhouse gas emissions issue, you know, we are still using heat, especially in some of these cooler cities, um, to heat up the farm and make sure that certain crops can grow. And then the combined sewage overflow, that's similar to the biodiversity challenge. You know, it isn't an outdoor farm, so there isn't much of an impact there. In the next slide, we have urban outdoor soil farms. And so over here, you 
you find that you do have a benefit when it comes to biodiversity and pollinator loss. Um, and there is also um, a benefit when it comes to the urban heat island effect. So a lot of times um, you find that waste heat is definitely an issue. And so this isn't something um, that these farms typically have to worry about too much. And when it comes to the combined sewage overflow, urban outdoor soil farms are probably some of the strongest tools to use when it comes to this issue, because the soil helps percolate the rainwater instead of the concrete. And that's why you'll find that a lot of these farms are um, usually solutions for this problem, whether that's on a rooftop, soil farm, like Henry was mentioning, or just community gardens. And then finally, for the last one, um, we have rural regenerator, regenerative farms. Um, so I would say probably one of the biggest benefits is definitely the greenhouse gas emission benefit. Um, so typically, if you're not familiar with regenerative, regenerative agriculture, um, again, as I mentioned, waste heat is an issue. But with these sort of farms, they um, undergo practices like crop rotation, compost application, reducing tillage, you know, just trying to implement a lot of different organic agriculture methods that really help in reducing um, the carbon that's emitted. Um, the other kind of benefit that we see is, you know, there isn't, I think with when it comes to these sort of farms, freshwater contamination is something just making sure that the resources that are used are clean, filtered, you use as, as less water as you can, maybe it won't be as much as urban CEA farms save, but you do see these efforts with these farms as well. And then finally, the biodiversity and pollinator loss. Um, you know, one of the big objectives of um, these farms is, you know, making sure that the natural resources around them remain and that they even are part of this regenerative process of farming. Um, and so again, if we go to the last slide, you know, I'm, we're going to kind of underline here that, you know, the, with all these challenges, again, the only solution is combining solutions. So you want to think about what's right for you. So think about the fact of like, what issues do you care about? Um, where are you based? Do you have access to enough land? Do you have capital to make controlled environment agriculture work? Or do you have enough community support to make some of these community gardens work? And that's just kind of the takeaway with these sort of slides that we want you to think about. Um, and then moving on to the final section, the drivers for CEA and vertical farming. Thank you so much, Yara. Um, it's so important to think about you know, the way agriculture works is we try to think about what are the various impacts and how does that drive the decision. We think successful urban farming is really based upon understanding your context and matching the right solutions with it. This is really design thinking and practice. What are all the possible solutions to this problem and how can you match the right one with it? And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to help you frame your thinking. You may not agree with some of our assessment and that's okay. What we're doing here is we're giving you the methodology to really think about what's driving things in your context, and what's gonna make a difference. So this is kind of a, an overview, another example of what Yara did, just in a bigger picture if we look globally. So we're, this is like, this is specifically looking at vertical farming or even like really high tech, expensive, expensive greenhouses. This is not all of urban agriculture, I would say. So I tried to kind of go through the world and think about what are the drivers, just similar to what Yara did, water scarcity, food safety, limited land, uh, bad, unfavorable weather, think Russia or think Saudi Arabia, demand for local, some of that data of people willing to pay more for it, innovation leadership. If we look at Australia, if we look at uh, parts of Asia, they're trying to be innovators. So they're willing to invest in subsidized technologies to show that they're food innovators. And then food security. If we look at the UAE, for example, they have a new food security minister. We, they want to be in the top 10 of the food security list globally, a desert country. Right? So that's enough it's incentive to kind of drive things, drive something as radical and as expensive as vertical farming. So as we can see, if we look in places like California, there are certain drivers that might make hydroponics and greenhouses going, but not really enough points that would justify me buying or building a $100 million vertical farm, for example. If I go to the Northeast, however, I start to see more of those ticks. So maybe it makes a little bit more sense to start producing local greens there since they're imported mostly from Arizona and California. Central Europe as well doesn't have that many ticks. And that's maybe why you're a skeptic about vertical farming, because you get it. You understand there may, may not be enough drivers to make sense here. But if we look at some of the news in Europe, we're seeing that some of the drivers that are making these farms go 
is a little bit of that weather issues, but also a little bit maybe around food safety in some ways. And that's not ticked here, but I think there's some groups that are saying we can market this as cleaner to our consumers and they're investing in that experiment. If we look in the Middle East, I'm actually calling you today from Muscat, Oman, we see ticks all across the board, right? So suddenly vertical farming, something that is extreme and, and capital intensive, um, now starts to make sense. And there's many drivers that can justify that. And again, we go across the board and we see some of these. Australia is an unusual one. I, I, you may not agree with my assessments of Australia, um, but, but I think that it also has some similar drivers, especially with these new issues that are happening and make the initial investment in vertical farming innovation um, more important. So I invite you to do this on your own. You can think about parts of Belgium. You can think about all of Europe. You can think about all of the world. It's up to you. Now you have the tools to make that assessment on your own. So we're coming to close to the end of the webinar and I wanna share with you some really exciting next steps that you can engage in to really develop your knowledge of urban agriculture further as part of our par partnership with Bon. And so the first one is our urban agriculture classes. So um, Yara, me, Alberto Lopez, who is one of our colleagues, uh, graduated from Bakhring University. Uh, we've essentially got six different classes about urban agriculture covering economics, covering how do you choose equipment, the class is pretty heavily focused on controlled environment agriculture, CEA. I heard that was a question for definition. So it's pretty focused on that, but the principles taught apply to all of urban agriculture, just like we've covered here. To help you think about how to plan that business, how to build your economic model, how to choose your crops, how to choose your equipment. And it's all online. And so it's a video classes followed by activities that you can do. And we're creating a discount in partnership with Barbon of $50 for the classes so that you can access them and you can benefit from them. And so as part of this software product that we've built, which is called Agritecture Designer, classes is one of the tools. The other tool is really the feasibility builder. So if you wanna spend a little bit more money and dive deep into your plan, you can spend $249 or $200 with a discount from Born Born membership. And you can actually develop a 10 year economic projection of a, of a greenhouse or vertical farm. You can even do soil based greenhouses in there. And so what it allows you to do is allows you to plan your business in more detail and even conduct market research. How do you do that? And it's all online. And so with this, with this um, pricing, you actually get 90 days of access. So for 90 days, you can experiment and you can build unlimited number of projects completely online, which is much lower cost than some of the alternatives of kind of researching online on your own or hiring different consultants or talking to different technology providers. This is a really good first step that we've tried to make affordable for you to try it out and plan your business. So this is how you can sign up. You just go to design.agritecture.com. If you're a Born Bon member, um, you, can, you can get a code from Nele and she'll give you access to that. So you get the $50 off and it's very easy to sign up. If you wanna give it a try now, there's actually a free part where you can just enter uh, some details about what you wanna do and just kind of experiment with it. And it'll give you kind of some resources of the kind of farm you might be building. So just go to this website and then click build completely free, you can get started. If you want to go for the paid versions, just follow up with Nele or me and we'll make sure to get you that code so you can sign up. So this is kind of an overview of those prices I mentioned. So this first part is free. You kind of get a vision report and some inspiring farms. The second part is $99 for 30 days of access to the classes. That includes all the classes and the activities. And then the starter bundle is what I refer to with the feasibility builder, your kind of business planner, plus the classes plus a market research tool. So that's kind of the bundle there. And, and as you can see on the website, we have some entry level consulting services available if you are really serious about building your farm. Next up, I'm gonna unmute uh, Nele and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about Born Bun membership. Yes, thank you, Henry and Yara for this uh, great presentation. I will now explain a bit about the membership and uh, I will do this in Dutch, uh, but you can still follow uh, the slide in English uh, if you want. Dus uh, Boerenwond is een organisatie van mannen tuinbouwers in België, voornamelijk Vlaanderen. Um, bij ons kunnen eigenlijk alle voedselproducenten die uh, professioneel ondernemen uh, terecht, zowel uh, ondernemers vanuit de stad, maar ook uh, uiteraard uh, daar rond. Wat hebben wij te bieden voor mensen die uh, bezig zijn met voedselproductie en dan in tuinbouw? Uh, wij bieden heel wat interessante vormingen en netwerkevents aan. Uiteraard in eerste instantie om de kennis uh, te delen, maar zeker ook, uh, nu is dat iets moeilijker, maar uh, zeker ook om in contact te komen met andere ondernemers. 
Daarnaast kan je bij ons ook terecht voor allerlei individuele vragen die je hebt bij de uitlating van je bedrijf. Bijvoorbeeld pakken van gronden, afspraken maken is heel belangrijk. De werkstelling, voedselveiligheid en andere wetgeving die bij landbouw komt kijken. Maar ook zeker vragen die gelinkt zijn aan je ondernemingsplan en bepaalde nieuwe technieken die je wil verkennen. Ten slotte, en ik denk zeker voor vandaag ook heel interessant om te vermelden, is dat wij een aanbod hebben specifiek voor nieuwe boeren, eigenlijk mensen, nieuwe starters en dan in tuinbouw. Daar helpen we in eerste instantie heel graag mee om de administratieve verplichtingen in orde te brengen bij opstart. Maar zijn we ook ter beschikking om samen het ondernemingsplan te bekijken, meer specifiek aan de hand van het Business Model Canvas. We hebben daar een kleine brochure over geschreven. Meer info daarover op de website. En rechts in de um, grafiek zie je dan uiteindelijk ook wat zo'n lidmaatschap kost bij ons. Wij maken een onderscheid tussen leden in hoofdberoep en uh, landbouwers in bijberoep. Belangrijk hierbij is dat uh, nieuwe leden in het eerste jaar uh, aan de halve prijs lid kunnen worden en dat het eigenlijk ook uh, fiscaal aftrekbaar is. Dus indien je daarover vragen zou hebben, dat is heel kort samengevat van uh, de vele activiteiten die wij eigenlijk doen. Maar moest je daar nog meer vragen over hebben, uh, aarzel dan zeker niet om met ons contact op te nemen. So uh, this was some uh, short information on the membership. Um, I'm happy to uh, ask Henry now to explain what's the timeline uh, for the upcoming commercial uh, urban farming classes, where Boerenbond members also get a discount. Thank you. So I'll do this in English. <laughs> so, um, so, so again, this is really just the taster towards urban agriculture, getting you interested and excited. We hope you found this valuable, but there's so much more coming up. So what we're doing now is starting now, you can request those discount codes to nail it for, the, um, for the, the class. We call it the CUF class, Commercial Urban Farming class. It's completely online and, you, and we want you to sign up between the 20th and the 24th. And you can use that code and there's a max of people that can get it. So I definitely recommend you reach out to Nele as soon as possible to get that. And if you're not a Bowen Bowen member, definitely join so you can get that discount. Um, And you're also welcome just to sign up for the class as well. If you're not a member, you can sign up. You don't get the discount, but you can sign up. And then you get the benefit of webinar two. So webinar two is going to be um, me and my colleague, Jeffrey. We actually went to uh, Belgium and Nelly gave us an amazing tour. I believe we saw 20 different types of urban farms. And so we're going to be talking about, we're talking about our experience and our perspective and the local context. Try to add some case studies locally in Belgium, specifically about urban agriculture, what's happening. And we may even have some guest urban farmers on that. So we'll see, stay tuned for that. But webinar two is happening May 4th and you can only get invit invited to it if you signed up for the CUF class. So be sure to do that first step. After May 4th, if you wanna go further, we are providing a special discount and you can ask Nelly for the price for that, but a special discount to agriculture consulting. So we've reduced our rates significantly for one hour up to Borbon members. And this even applies to Borbon members that have a, a small company or multiple team members that want to work together. So if you have two to four people or one to four people that you want, you can get on a call with one of our consultants. Let's say you want to talk about lighting, or you want to talk about irrigation, or you want to talk about choosing your, your method, or you want to talk about economics. You let us know, we'll match you with the right consultant and get you going with that at a discounted rate for one hour. And that happens for the entire month, April 27th to May 27th, for Bowen Bowen members. And so this is just another review of the CUF classes. This is what you can expect. And I definitely encourage you to sign up if you're serious about this. And you get that $50 discount with the email. You'll get a special code for that. And so we're covering, covering the introduction, which is a little bit more of me, but trust me, it's a bit different from this class. Economics with Yara, deep dive, technology, marketing, energy. And then lesson six is focused on organic. Now, We understand in Europe, you can't be certified organic if you're hydroponic, but this may be interesting for you if you want to pursue, let's say, the, the understanding of what organic is for a more ecological type of urban farm, let's CEA, um, but not necessarily for certification, which isn't possible. And so it's all taught by different members of our team and there's activities connected to it. So next up, we're going to dive into some questions. So you can put your questions in the chat um, and I'm going to go through the ones that have already been asked. I really want to thank Yara and Nele so far and everyone for participating. And let's see if we can get through these questions. So question one is, what is the minimum size for a basement farm? So remember when we talked about the basement farms, 
they're typically um, you know, in very urban areas. And I think some of the best examples of that are probably Farm One. And if you look in Paris, La Caverne is a really good example of it as well. If you look in Belgium, there's uh, Champignon de Brousse that's also in the basement as well. That's a really good example. And so you know, the, the minimum size I would say is probably 200 square meters. And that is really a high-end vertical farm growing microgreens and specialty herbs for restaurants. And that's about the minimum that Farm One has. And they're in the basement of a Tribeca building in New York. And they supply within 30 minutes to very high-end, very expensive restaurants. So it's going to be very difficult to make that business work if you don't have the demand of really top paying customers like Michelin star restaurants. If you have um, less high end customers, you're going to have to increase your scale to compete a little bit on volume and to provide more value to other customers. And again, if you're growing 200 varieties of small things that you're selling very expensive each, that only works in certain cities and certain places. While at scale, you can produce more volume consistency, consistency to feed say a person's you know, salad every week. And, and, and supply a retailer or a restaurant. So question two, can you get a real living earth on a rooftop? I think that refers to you know, the, the, the activity that happens with the microbiome within the soil. Can you do that on a rooftop? Um, the answer is yes. If you look at different depths of roofs, you can get that. Obviously, if you have more depth and if your soil is higher quality, and over time, you're gonna be able to achieve that as long as you manage your crops above it properly. Um, but it's not a guarantee and you have to move all of that up. I really invite you to check out Brooklyn Grange, which is the world's largest uh, rooftop farm. Maybe now, I think Paris is about to have the largest, but it, it's about an acre of farming on a rooftop. And they had to actually use a vacuum to bring all the soil up. And they grow all kinds of crops on there. Um, in some places, they even grow a little bit of corn um, and various crops. So they do have quite a bit of depth in there. And you can see it's on an industrial building to support that depth. But definitely it's possible to create all the wonderful things that happen in soil that create flavor and create wonderful activity for the plants on a rooftop as well, definitely. Question three, if the CEA is supplied with green energy, wouldn't it decrease the greenhouse gas emissions or have lower greenhouse gas emissions compared to other types of agriculture? Well, I think it depends on, the, your second part is will it be lower than other types? It really does depend on the crop and where it's sourced from and what time of year it's sourced from. Each of those variables are gonna defy that. So if you have a, a, an abundant local supply of something year round, to grow that in CEA, and, and that's being grown outdoors, to grow that in CEA, it's gonna be difficult to compete with that. If you have something that's grown outdoors for a season and then the rest of the year it's imported and then you grow it indoors with green energy, yes, it may be competitive from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. To answer your first question, yes, it, it can be competitive and it can reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. But I think when we're trying to talk globally about reducing emissions entirely, we don't really wanna add new energy sources to the model um, unless they're significantly lower than the other activity. So if agriculture is typically significantly lower in greenhouse gas emissions, if we're adding new energy demand and building green energy infrastructure, that embodied energy has a greenhouse gas emissions effect and we may, it may not always be the best solution. So we shouldn't just add more demand just because we have green energy we should move that green energy to cover the current demand. I think that's part of the critique for CEA, is building very intensive, day-long um, energy consumers. If it's green, it's definitely better, but it's not necessarily what we need to do long-term, depending on who you are and, and, and what your impact is as a country. I hope that's helpful. Uh, question four, I think, was answered by Yara. Is that correct? Okay. Do you want to answer it here, Yara, just one more time for everyone? So is this the, this is the question in regards to the freshwater water usage, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it just represented um, utilizing 70% less water than traditional agriculture. Okay, great. So that's a clarification of your statement. Question five, do you have examples of animal raising in urban agriculture other than chickens? You're right, chickens are typically um, the, the, the animal products you see in urban farms in North America. But I think if you look towards Asia, you might see more goats, you might see other kinds of animals, you might see pigs. Um, definitely you're gonna see other kinds of animals there as well. If you look at urban agriculture in a place like Lagos, Nigeria, you're gonna see a lot more animal husbandry. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with animal husbandry, so I'm not familiar with, with, with that practice. But in my studies of urban agriculture, there are definitely a lot of examples in the global south, where there's a lot more variety and also a lot more animal husbandry. Now, when we think about the city, there's the urban area, 
the urban core, and then there's the peri-urban areas, what's called English. And this is an area where maybe in the West, it's more developed in the suburbs, but if we look in places like Mexico City or Lagos, or if we look in places in Asia, it actually is an area where they have limited water sometimes, some neighborhoods are wealthier. It's really an area of kind of evolution of the city, where it's kind of developing and modernizing, but also still rural. And so in those areas, we definitely see some significant size farms um, that are actually growing all kinds of animals. Um, just a, an unusual note, in, in China, they're actually experimenting with vertical farming of pigs, which I think is very intense, but they create controlled environments and they create stacked levels um, in cities where they produce pigs on multiple levels. So controlled environment agriculture and animal husbandry have merged in a place where resource scarcity and population growth has gotten so extreme that they're even experimenting with that. I had one conversation um, about the movement of animals across ships to be um, slaughtered in other places, and they actually stack them as well there. So you can kind of see examples of kind of the vertical farming of animals already starting to begin, um, which may or may not make you feel comfortable. So let's go on to the questions. Bea, what do we have? We've got more here. Um, I'm moving on to question six. In the classes, do you consider legal issues and permits? We definitely think about zoning and permitting um, and certifications when you're thinking about different options. And I think when we talk about rooftop greenhouses, especially, we talk about additional challenges with that. Anything to add to that, Yara? No, it's true that we, we do think about that um, just in contextualizing kind of the costs as well and just making sure you consider those. Um, and it is also mentioned, um, you know, not just permitting, but also just different um, legal issues globally that impact what you can grow and how it's packaged and how it's categorized. Yeah, so I wouldn't say we have it for your city specifically, but if we think mm -hmm. there's going to be a legal or permitting issue, we usually say it and we say this is another thing you want to be aware of and ask. Um, and I think it's even in some of the activities, if I recall yeah. correctly. So yep. moving on. That's to a question. good question. We, we may uh, support uh, when there are issues on uh, local uh, questions for permits. Uh, we can support those if we know more about the, uh, the case. Yeah, I mean, that's another benefit of membership and association is it's got that local knowledge that you can ask and, and get those specific questions answered. Thank you. Um, so question seven, will ground-based urban farming be covered extensively in the courses or is it focused more on CEA? The courses are focused on CEA, I would say. Um, again, we teach the principles of, of, of market research or equipment selection, but we do focus on that decision if you're building a greenhouse or a vertical farm. So if you want to build a large scale on the ground, soil based farm in the city, uh, it probably isn't the, the, the only course you should consider. If you want to build that on a rooftop or if you want to actually start integrating into the spaces, I think you're going to get more benefit from it. And if you're even thinking about any kind of indoor farming for microgreens or a small greenhouse for your nursery, this is going to be especially value for you to, to make those decisions. So that's kind of how you can make the decision about the class. Um, question eight, with regards to what you called food deserts in cities, usually areas where low income individuals and families live, how do you reach such individuals when on average CEA farm produce is more expensive than regular produce? How do you close that social gap? That's a big question. That's a really good question that we talk about a lot in New York, as a lot of these CEA companies are raising a lot of money and there's a history of community gardens that have been growing food in soil giving it for free for a long time. And they see these companies raising money and, and selling expensive food. I think what's really interesting is two examples. Again, we're from New York, so, so we'll talk about that a lot, but I think they could apply to other places. One of them is Teens for Food Justice. So Teens for Food Justice converts classrooms and uses vertical farming technology to grow food. The students grow that food and then they take it home to their families and they learn cooking at school and they actually start to change the very complicated long process of changing behavior towards healthy eating and giving access to that food to reduce the costs for buying fresh foods. And so CEA in some contexts can actually provide a huge advantage. So the companies that are advancing and raising money, that technology, that knowledge, that talent is actually dispersing into the population. And we're seeing nonprofits take on CEA and say, you know, I can utilize this for my community. Another example is Harlem Grown, which has a very low-tech greenhouse. Now you can build low-tech greenhouses and extend your season and actually helped Harlem Grown winterize their greenhouse. We, we, we created an insulation cover over the summer 
and we got some donations of lights and we were able to extend it so it never stopped producing. It slowed down in the winter. We we're able to extend it throughout the entire year. And so CEA becomes this thing that becomes more available knowledge wise, even for nonprofits and food access and food equity groups to, to learn about and take part in. So it doesn't always have to be crazy expensive. Um, but I do think that if you're, if you're growing a product that is more expensive, you should be very careful about how you're talking about feeding the population and how you're talking about providing access and food security, because the people that need that food the most often don't get it. So that's, a, I think, a marketing and policy question as well. Bea, do we have some wrap up? Okay, got some more. I think I was, uh, that's a great question. Question nine, um, what is the minimum depth of an outdoor rooftop vegetable garden, maximum kg per meter squared? I don't have the, the kg per meter squared, but I guess the, the minimum is probably gonna be, I'm trying to think in feet. I think it's two feet minimum for um, a, an extensive green roof. I think it's about six feet to eight feet for a, an extensive one, which is really, Basically, if you look at the green roofing types, you can see specific depth in your language, and it's very similar to urban agriculture. Um, you're just gonna wanna go with the deeper one if you're gonna grow crops that grow much deeper. Um, if you have more questions about that, follow up with me. I'm happy to get you those answers. Is it financially possible to create a CSA farm with CEA farming? Certainly, there's a lot of CSA models, community supported agriculture models with CSA farms. In fact, when you create a CSA, you're getting money up front often. People are buying the entire share. And so that can help offset some of the expensive costs and operating costs of your farm. And so I think it's very possible for CA farms. I do think that fits within the small and medium scale range though. I think as you go more high scale, um, it's gonna be less common that you do a CSA operation because the volume of boxes you have to produce doesn't make as much sense as selling to single large buyers. But there's certainly examples of that and, and agriculture certainly work with clients on developing their models for that. It's great because you create a really good relationship with your customer. So there's a lot of benefits to CSAs. Um, and actually now with COVID-19, CSA demand has gone over the, it's just gone out of the roof. People wanna buy directly from the farms. They wanna get it delivered or they wanna pick it up in an easy way. Question 11, I think this is probably our last one. Um, can you create a rainwater reservoir in concrete, plastic or other materials? Um, yeah, I mean, you can create a, a, a rainwater reservoir, reservoir with any material um, that really keeps the water out and, and prevents it from leaking. Um, when I was working on a project in uh, Nicaragua, we were actually developing one out of the local materials in the ground to create that and a custom pump. So you just have to look about your own location, but um, definitely the typical one is plastic containers from some kind of catchment that stores that rainwater. But you could do it with concrete too. You see a lot of concrete ones in Mexico City as well. Okay, last one, question 12. Do you really have to rely on subsidies to make a farm profitable or feasible? Or do you have enough examples of organizations that make a profit? Okay, tough questions, I love it. Um, you know, agriculture, let me just start off with this. Every new business is difficult and typically nine out of 10 new businesses will fail. And I think sometimes we're very tough on agriculture, but we forget that when somebody's starting a new farm, they already have the challenges of entrepreneurship on them. The next thing is, is that we, we have a society that really doesn't value food very much thankfully in Europe a little bit more, um, but that's made it difficult to make an income over the past generations out of agriculture. So margins typically range from three to 16%. Now CEA in some cases can push that, but it comes at a cost um, because you create consistency and, and, you, and you can create consistent demand. It creates new opportunities to improve the margin, but you have to spend a lot of CapEx to get that. There are profitable urban farms, definitely. Most of the profitable urban farms, in my opinion, are in the small and medium category and have diversified income sets with ed education, um, entertainment, and production. That's the honest truth. It's still too early to say whether the big vertical farms are profitable or going to be. They just haven't been around long enough um, and they have high capex that they have to get back. But I think a lot of them and their investors are betting on a future that doesn't necessarily exist yet. Whew, so many questions, okay. Uh, we have to wrap up today, but there's so much more to cover. So Agritecture is so excited for this collaboration and we're so excited that all of you joined today. I really wanna thank Yara and Bea and Nele, and I wanna thank all of you for participating and learning about this topic while you're at home. I really hope you're safe and sound during this difficult time. Feel free to reach out to us and ask questions. And remember on that timeline, we, you can now start to register for the CUF class. Just contact Nele for that discount code and make sure you join the association. 
Thank you so much for your time and take care.